So I want to, first of all, I want to, I want to say it's an honor to be working with Scott Patterson from Sobnet, which has been around since I think 1988. Um, so I'm Glenn Brooks. I actually host a national show and I'm a, I'm a professional speaker and author. And I, I think, let me see, I was in, I had, I had my first job experience in the seventies. I was amazed and at the unconventional one of a kind safe car. And, uh, to this day, and I want to give you guys a recent example. A recent example is I just got a 2004 95 five speed manual. And uh, I bought it from J Jerry McDonald from New Jersey. Now he came there with his friend. Jerry had just bought a hundred thousand dollar Tesla. But when he came to see me, we just stood around this car and talked about the amazing qualities of this car, the five speed turbo 2004. He still loved this car very much. And uh, he gave me, before he left, he gave me $20 because it said it's Irish good luck to always pay the buyer $20. So he did that. And I want to say something about Sobnet. It's, it's, it's not just selling cars. The community of people on Sobnet, this is an unacknowledged, I, don't, I haven't told Scott I'm going to say this, but the quality of people is incredibly high. And the key thing about getting a Sob is the quality of care. The people that I speak to on Sobnet, for the most part, have cherished these cars that has a family history. And that's why uh, these people become family friends, many of them, that I bought cars from. Uh, anyway, I see the show as much more than a talk show. I see it as a resource for the, for the unconventional smart people that are drawn to Saab and the one-of-a-kind people that service them. It's another quick plug. Definitely go to a, a certified Saab mechanic like, like Dave Dickerson. Chris, I've been working with Chris Rizon up in Dorset, Vermont, for probably 14 years. I've referred to you from all around the country to him. I feel he's one of a kind. I, I did a graphic, or my graphic artist did a graphic. I call it the Saab Barbershop because when people get there, we all we don't mind waiting. We love sharing Saab stories, and people are there own nine thousands that they come. People bring their SPGs. So um, Chris is incredibly committed to the Saab. You know, been working on Saabs probably over thirty five years. He's mm -hmm. my main Saab mechanic. But I certainly know many many people who go to Dave Dickerson. I'm honored to have Dave. Welcome to the to the Saab and Travel Show, Dave. I'm glad you're here with us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, uh, Glenn, I believe Josh has joined the call. Fantastic. Tell me, Josh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. I'm gonna, first of all, it's great. I want to say, Josh, I, I didn't say this to you the other day, but over the last 15 years, and I've been very close with several saw mechanics, including Dave Connor, who I think stepped down in a meeting in New York. And every time, what I love about um, and why we're, gonna, we're working with Goldwing is, out of 15 years of experience, any time a part didn't work, they immediately shoot out a new part. They have great attitudes. They they love the Saab community. So when, for any used parts, this is a company I've had over 15 years of experience, and, and it's a pleasure to have Josh on. I love talking to these guys. They they know the cars like the back of their hand. They're wonderful. So welcome. The last week we mentioned you guys, Josh, and I'm and I'm so happy to be working with you and Goldwyn. Welcome. Hey, thank you. I mean, we really appreciate everybody um, that calls and supports us, and uh, and and we're here for forever, you know. Um, we're, That's we're, great. We're back. So, yeah. Well, Josh, I'm I'm Josh, Christian, Dave. I'm here forever. I get response from all around the country, and I'm always so excited when people find this car, this Saab, and they realize the history, the unconventionalness, and realize that in modern day times now. This car is an amazing car, and if you go to a Saab mechanic and treat it well, it will last many hundreds of thousands of miles. It's going to last long. You just got to go to someone. Don't bring it to a shop that doesn't know it. Don't use cheap oil and parts. And so Goldwing's with us. All right. Let's focus a little on the 9.5 and open it up to your questions in a moment. The last, I guess, seven years, I've been really into 9.5. I'm looking to get a mint condition retro 9,000 because it kind of holds the um, – the amazing history, unconventional, the, the whole mindset and soul set of Saab was to make a car that was accessible, that was incredibly safe, had an incredible performance. And it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a challenging conversation. It seems like GM kept a lot of things going, but missed some of the, you know, this is something you guys can look into, but there's some, everyone's got a different point of view about it. But I would think most of the people would agree that the 9.5, which I drive now, I have a five speed, is a pretty amazing car. Um, that's incredibly safe. I had someone, many people have said to me, they think it's still one of the safest cars on the road and well performing. So let's do this. Let's open up your questions. I'm so happy you're all here. This is going to be your Saab community show. It's called the Saab and Travel Show. And along with Scott, Dave Dickerson and Chris, your questions, your comments, 
And I'm, I'm ready, Scott, for the unconventional smart people who have joined the call today. Your questions. Welcome. Okay. All right. This is Dave Ost in California. I have a question. So please. I have an four nine hundred. Okay. Speak and speak up a little bit, everybody. Uh, what was I, the model? I have an eighty four nine hundred. Eighty four sob nine hundred. Okay. Did you get that, Dave Ost? Yeah. Eighty four nine hundred. It's uh, like you were mentioning. It's uh, it's been in the family since the beginning. Not not necessarily the same part of the family, but it's been in the family since the beginning. Okay? Here's okay. what I'm having a challenge with. Finding, and now in California what happens, the car doesn't rust, but the rubber rots. So I need door seals, window seals, all those kinds of external parts. Where where What's a good source for finding door and window seals? Uh, you know, on an 84, I've been having a really hard time. Well, let's go, let's go to Josh. Let's go to Josh. You take this one. And I want to make a quick comment that this is something a lot of people bring up. I want to get to the bottom of this today. A lot of people say that the parts are not available. And some people say they absolutely are. What's your comment, Josh, on this, on this year, this vintage and, and parts? Well, what I'd have to say is that um, they are hard to get good parts because most people keep those cars and don't send them to the yard. Um, with that being said, um, the, uh, we do have a couple of them that are in, uh, in trailers that we leave throughout the winter so we can access parts to them. Um, with that being said, I, um, I, I might actually have something out there um, in one of those trailers. We, uh, I, I got a couple of restorations that are pretty nice that I'll be taking apart in the spring. So, oh, great. Yeah, and we'll, we'll give out. We'll give out. We'll give out the contact. There's Go ahead. Some chance I can find the door and window rubber. I can get a lot of the other parts. I mean, I've, I've sourced them all over the world from Europe, etc. I got my air conditioning compressor from England. You know, so I've been able to find a lot of mechanical parts. But the tricky thing is the rubber, the external rubber, door and window seals. That's the hard stuff for me right now. If uh, any other sobbers on who are on, I have most everybody unmuted. If if you have uh, if you've come across sources and, and have something to contribute please. to this question, please go right ahead. Uh, please, Rose, please. Rose Pellegrino, in New York State, below the uh, Finger Lakes, has a great selection of 900s. Um, she's re her husband passed away, but uh, she's still continuing to sell a bunch of parts out of the yard in the barn. And they used to own what, what was the person? Uh, what was what the contact, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find it here. So, yeah, yeah, and take take your time. Speak up and everybody get their pens ready. Chris, is there anything you want to add to the conversation waiting for the phone number? Waiting for the phone number on this Finger Lake connection. Uh, her name is Ro Her name is Rose. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. Go ahead. Her name is Rose. She um, she used to own Foreign Motor Repair, if that's who I recall you guys are talking about. Um, she used to come to Goldwing, um, and it was a very good friend of ours and her husband before he passed. But um, I'm pretty sure that's who you guys are talking about. Rose is her name from Foreign Motor Repair. Yes. yes is this, are all these audio lines open? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you need to speak up. At can, can you hear me? I have a suggestion. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, speak up. What's your What's your name? What's your name? My name is Dave. My name's Dave. I'm in Sudbury, Mass. I've been a Sobnet member since I got my 2003 Arrow. Beautiful. 2003. Beautiful. Um, Welcome. I also have a question about that, but I want to see if maybe I can help the fella out in California. Please go there's, ahead. There's a guy that I found in Athol, A T H O L, Athol, Massachusetts. Uh, and he has a little saw parts company that he calls Red Arrow, A-E-R-O, Red Arrow, one word, dot com. He has a website, um, and he's got uh, two or three dozen cars in a yard, and from the photo, I think he had some 900s. Okay. And he's a great All guy, right. very, very responsive, and he wants to keep them running. Hmm. Okay. O okay, so, so Red Arrow... A T H O L Massachusetts. I could probably right. uh, do an internet search and find it, right? Yeah, actually, let me see if I have his phone number. I'll give it to you. Okay, quick, right. great. 
9449. Okay, so red arrow, 978 314 9449. Yeah. Okay. I how about how about Rose? Did anybody find Rose's uh, contact information? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I believe that's 607 272 8259. Um, I, okay. also I also have her email. Uh, I talked to her a couple years ago. She uh, mm -hmm. let me know that she had sold. Um, he had sold Pellegrino Sob Service, uh, and her email address is Rose Pell. That's R O S E P E L L two. That's the number two. Rose Pell two at yahoo.com. That was a while ago, but uh, so I'm not sure if that email address is still valid. Yeah. I was out there this summer. Oh, okay, so bought a parts car, and uh, she has two guys working in the shop, and she's kind of held on to the parts end of things. You know the selling used parts and all and okay yeah. hey i just want to get i want to get i want to just get uh chris to step in he's our master saw he's our regular come on my, my regular call is chris rizon from rizon sob chris has worked on these sobs for 35 years people travel everywhere to go see him chris what's your comment about parts or anything to add to this conversation about well, parts uh, definitely rubber parts are you know going to be harder to find uh because they do deteriorate so uh yeah, any place I guess you can find them is, uh, I don't know of any new sources anymore. Okay. Um, so used is, I guess, the only choice you have at this point in time. Okay. Yeah, that's no. my experience. So so let me let me just be, just come back for just a second. I just want to regroup on Rose's phone number, see if I got it right. Please, please. 607-272-8259. That that's what's showing up on my web search. Um, I I have okay. a post and then, but I'm not there. And then it's it's Rose L two as was it Yahoo.com? Yahoo.com, correct. No. Okay, and it's R O S E P E double L and then the number two. Correct. Okay, she has okay, a great. All that. Thanks for the there. referrals, guys. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, if anybody has any further ideas on uh, on rubber parts, uh, let me give you a phone number. You can give me a shout. Uh, nine two five two three one five three one three. Nine two five. Say, you, say your name again. One five. Uh, Dave Ost. O H S. Okay, Dave. Ost. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, nine two five two three one five three one three. Thank By the way, you, you are listening. Oh, you're really welcome. You're listening to the Saab and Travel Show on Glenn Brooks. Saab uh, Universe, I guess it is for me. I love I love and treasure that the, the mechanics, by the way, are wonderful all around the country. We used to work very close with Walter at the right solution, and Walter's moved out of the country. But these people have made such a difference. The spirit and the uh, the unconventional wisdom is so there. Um, Chris, is there anything more? you? I know someone had a question, too, about a – was it a 2003 Arrow? <laughs> Let's listen to Chris first. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Sure. Uh, what about the arrow? Well, I know there was. I think he has a question. He has a question about the arrow. Ask you a question, please, about the arrow for Chris. Oh, all right. Well, yeah, it's, it's up to you. Know, I, have a, I have a 2003. It's Dave, by the way. Another Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. 2003 arrow, a manual, a unicorn car which I've had since new, love dearly, and, and maintain with a fantastic mechanic that some of you may know, Ralph Bakovin in Acton, Massachusetts. Um, and it's pretty flawless. I maintain the hell out of it. But I'm at 168K now, and I'm just starting to wonder, how long is this clutch going to last? Great question. It's, there's no wow, problems with it at all, but that seems like high miles for a clutch yeah, it's, that is pretty high mileage. He must be a pretty good driver. <laughs> I, <laughs> I went to, I I went to said, Arrow Academy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of them fail uh, quite a bit sooner than that. Um, I just had somebody call me the other day with a, a 2007 with about 160 some thousand, and his clutch is just starting to go. Uh so, I mean, I guess as long as it's not slipping, um, it's hard to say how much longer you have in that. 
Maybe it's just it, a miracle car. Yeah. Is it? So I remember. Okay. So when I used to go see Dave Connor, and I, and I want to ask about the manual, he used to tell, and there was a lot of disagreement about this one with for, for the automatic. Uh, Dave Connor, who's worked on, so I was actually about 50 years of his, I, I think he, I've heard he's retired, but he used to say it's significant to change the transmission fluid in the automatic. Is there any servicing issues, Chris, that you recommend for people that have a high mileage manual? And I always want to get your comment on the automatic. Is there any preventative things or something Dave could do that would help? Other, than, other words, is it a waiting game or things you could do? Like, an, I don't know. Some, could, can you change the, the fluid on a manual as well? I don't know. You can change the fluid, the fluid um, you know, that, I mean, that wouldn't hurt, but, uh, I mean, as far as the clutch goes, uh, there's really no, uh, there's really no maintenance on that other than, I mean, I guess you could change the, uh, the clutch fluid in the, you know, in the. That's what uh, I meant. Yeah. I mean, I mean that you should probably do anytime you change the brake fluid. Okay. Uh, but I don't, that won't make the clutch last any longer as far as wear goes. Um, but it may, uh, you know, keep the, uh, master cylinder from, uh, getting gunked up and stuff. Okay, Dave Dickerson, I, your any your comment? You, I know you've seen a lot of these cars. What's your any comment about preventative maintenance or fluid changes as relevant to both the automatic and the manual that you think yeah, might make a difference? It's all up to the driver on the clutch life. You, know, you can make a you know a, a single driver car is not shared around a lot, and if they're reasonable, you'll never replace it. But you know, what? You, really. You can blow a clutch in, you know, less than 100,000 if you're flipping it and, you know, different people driving it and jamming it. Um, 9,000, the 9.5 clutch is pretty robust. It isn't like the big wow. clutch, you know, that you burn out every 50. But, um, mm -hmm. okay. One strong. thing one thing I've learned is um, before I put it in reverse, you know, to back out of the driveway, I slip it into first and then put it down to reverse because if I just go straight to reverse, there's a little bit of grinding, but first to reverse is always real smooth. They, they have a problem with the reverse synchro. Yeah. The synchro is so yeah. small, it'd be like a ring on your finger. And there was an update, yeah. there was an update kit for the synchros. But you're right, just kind of, you know, hit it, hit it forward here, then slide it into reverse. You can live with it that way. Yeah. It's been, been a long time. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Again, I just I just want yeah, to uh, make one one small correction. It's Dave Dickinson uh, from Rocky Top Guru. Dickinson, yes. yeah, not Dickerson. Dickinson. Dickinson. Correct. Yeah, yep. there you go. And he is a guru, um, so that's. Do we have another uh, another question? New topic. Yeah, open to open topic. Anything you guys want to talk about? Uh, Parts, maintenance, uh, unusual things. Uh, yeah, anybody with an unusual question, something you haven't been able to solve. I have a something question. that. Ha Please, what's your name? My name is Jim Mike. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Earlier, you guys mentioned rubber parts. Well, I was thinking, uh, how practical is it to replace like rubber bushings in the say the suspension? with polyurethane and does it take away from the drivability of the car we're talking about a, a nine five chris uh urethane yeah i mean um it, it, you'll definitely notice uh you know a little more uh transfer of uh you know road noise and stuff through through uh, uh urethane mm -hmm. Uh, it's a little bit stiffer, but it does it does tighten up the handling. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a trade off. Um, uh -huh. um, you know, I guess it depends on what your tolerance is for, uh, you know, vibration and stuff. Um, uh, you know, and what you're looking for. Well, there are probably uh, still a lot of uh, rubber parts for nine fives on the in, on the market, aren't there? What's that? Uh, shouldn't there still be a lot of rubber parts? On the market uh, for nine fives. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to get just about everything. Mm. All right. I have a model ninety six question. When you're ready. Yeah, please. Go. What's your name? Um, Todd Hickstrom. I have a hey, Todd. Welcome. Model. Thank you. I have a seventy two model ninety six with a horn grounding question that I've asked lots of people. And I can't get anyone to figure it out. Is there a Model 96 expert listening? <laughs> well, we got Chris. We got Chris. We go to Dave. Let's go to go to Chris first. Chris, go ahead. Chris, Chris Rizon from Rizon Saab. 
endorse okay. it for months. So yeah, it's a, it's a, what, what, what is the problem with the, so the horn, you know, I haven't worked horn, on a 96 in a while, but. Uh, well, the horn grounds, when you push the horn button, it grounds through the shaft of the steering column. Uh, the power comes up, it goes through the horn button. When you push, metal connects metal that's screwed to the to the steering shaft, then goes through the firewall into the engine compartment. So the ground has to go that direction. Uh, there's no other wire. Uh, and I have lost the ground. I've had to run a wire from up right behind the dashboard on the metal of the steering column down there's a there's one piece of metal for some reason doesn't connect connect electricity all the way down to the junction right by the firewall and if i connect a wire between those two points my horn will honk but have you anybody else ever had this grounding issue with a horn on a model Where 96 yeah, i've never run into it but i don't work on too many of those anymore mm. well that's okay. <laughs> uh, I, have That's a, right. I have a thought. This is, this is, guys, guys, I have a thought. This is Dave in California. Okay, um, Dave. Does, does the ground path have to go through a slip ring? In other words, if the wheel turns and you press the horn button, that means that there's got to be some kind of sliding contact on the steering column that transfers the current to the rotating wheel down to the solid steering shaft or the solid column, okay? All right? So there's some sliding slippering in there. So, the, you know, now, if the horn is not, is not on the rotating part of the steering wheel, then my comment doesn't apply, but I'll bet that that sliding contact is bad if, if, it, if in fact, it does exist. So that's a, that's a quick talk okay. for you guys. All right. No, I have a... I've, I've searched it and I'm fairly electrically knowledgeable. That slip ring is connected to the wire coming from the horn, the hot wire basically. It goes from the fuse okay. box through the horn all the way back through that slip ring, which touches the steering wheel whenever you're turning so it, and brings electricity to the horn button. When you push the horn button, there's metal contacts that look like the points of the distributor that connect and, and allow the, the power to keep going through. So the slip ring's fine. I've totally rebuilt it. It's beautiful. The power goes through that fine. The power does not go from the point I described down the steering shaft. So that's interesting. So, so but wouldn't, wouldn't there have to also be a sliding contact for the ground? Well, I wish there was. I certainly don't have one. I, I, there's no other wire in there. There's only, you know, the hot wire so, coming into into the horn button. So how how is it that the power can ring. come across the slip ring, it, but there's no slip ring for the ground side? I'm confused. I, well, I don't think they ever have a, a, a ground for no. the slip ring. I don't think there are like slip rings. There's only it, one. It's, it should ground through the it should ground through the steering column. Exactly. Yeah. But, I don't know. I mean there's I, there's some place where it's not uh you know, it's not making a connection anymore. I, you said you ran a wire from the column and, and that and that makes it work? Yeah, it works great. I just it's just it's kind of a it's been so interesting to try to follow the electricity of yeah, the horn and, I mean, how, and I imagine mean, the, how it could the, lose the conductivity. Yeah, I'm well, not well, sure what. There has to be some kind of sliding contact on the ground side. It's Come on, on the power side, right? May, uh, may I ask I, a question? No. Okay, okay. Let me just let me just say, let's take a, take a brief pause. You're listening to the Sovereign Travel Show. I'm Glenn Brooks. I'm the host, along with Scott Patterson, Sovnet, and. Um, uh, let's come back to this. Let's, I mean, let's, Scott, you have another idea. I think we should open the lines up. So and I do have a review yeah. today. We have, Go ahead. We, ha we do have, so everybody, just so you know, we, we do have 26 people on. Uh, Great. So, welcome, guys. Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. And, and you may need to be patient, but um, uh, yeah. someone just uh, uh, just got, uh, broke in and, and uh, has a question. Who is that? This is Tom. I'm from uh, Northwest Washington. But no, Welcome, Tom. It's about the, the, the horn issue. If I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've been underneath the dash of my Sonic because it's been stuck in the back of a garage. 
but there was a wire that looped around the steering column so it could tighten up or loosen up depending on which way the wheel turned and that was the return path yeah that was now your that, ground that's possible path. it almost sounds like somebody jerry rigged it <laughs> well this is from the factory though i mean that was i thought that was from the factory i've i've run across it in other models of cars where they had that wire that would wind or unwind as as the wheel turned you're talking about a clock spring yeah something similar it wasn't quite yeah something similar to that i guess uh, a Brian coil Lance spring I think it was a, a coil spring because it would go down the column in a spiral a loose spiral yeah i mean brian that makes ransom, sense are you on there can you hear me brian ransom uh, yes, brian, i guess i do yeah you have a, brian you uh, there what a 71 96 rally Yes, I yep. just uh, ended up uh, getting it here the end of December. Uh, it was actually one of the hard finds. The gentleman that bought it new um, had it stored for 35 years. So I'm in the process of tearing it down to restore. And uh, one of my biggest concerns is sort of the same as you guys with the 9.5s is the seals. Uh, door seals and window seals and um, all those sort of things in trying to find sources for those. I know Ashcraft has got some. Um, Tom Donnie has a few different things. Uh, and another gentleman that's been working on restoring this hob has found some Volkswagen parts um, that might fit, but I'm still looking for other sources. All right. You know what I want to do? I want to, I want to acknowledge on the call with us is someone I've used personally, and I, the integrity in the service is like none other. We got Josh from Goldwing. Josh, go on and give your contact because you, you carry a lot of obscure parts. The trust level is great. I've always enjoyed dealing with you guys. They're incredibly knowledgeable about stop parts. Josh, how do people reach you? And you can give out your website too if you want. And then comment you have about this topic, you know, that, about parts they're mentioning. Josh. Okay, it was a mess. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's goldwingsopparts.com. We're in upstate New York. Um, and uh, we've specialized in saw parts for, for a long time now, 32 years. And uh, long story short, it is, like Chris did mention, the plastic pieces and the rubbers are very hard to come by. And, and that's, that's going to be a, a tricky, it's going to be a tricky thing for everyone to find, you know, even us um, okay. with over with over 7,000 vehicles on my property, I, uh, you know, even I struggle to come up with those pieces, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to do our review. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. No problem. Um, we're going to do, we're going to do our review of the day. People ask me to review things and different companies send me parts. Uh, I've had Mary Andretti on when I, when I reviewed the Blizzax. Today I'm going to be reviewing the, the Discovery True North, the Discovery True North made by Cooper. Chris popped them on probably in, let's say beginning of November. I had 360 in my STG probably 15 years ago, and that taught me a real lesson. The lesson was get really good winter tires. There's only two companies I might, might trust about an all so-called all-season all season tire. Most of them are not all-season. They're kind of, except for maybe the uh, Nakian and maybe the new, um, oh, there's another one I can mention to you. I'm just forgetting the name of the tire. But this one, for the winter, is one of the best winter tires I've ever used. It's a Discovery True North and it's like having a, a you know, sh sh sharpened ice skates. This stuff is amazing. I give away vacations and I go to retreat centers of very icy roads in places like Vermont, New Hampshire, and upstate New York. And this has been a fabulous tire. It's the Discovery True North made by Cooper. I'm going to be doing brake reviews, high performance brakes in the next uh, program. Anything you want me to review, let me know. Anything out there you're curious about to increase your longevity and enjoyment of your car, including, you know, performance parts. Um, let me see. Chris, do you, have, you want to say anything about um, anything? Uh, maybe we could ask Dave as well from Rocky Top Guru. Anything that you feel, because a lot of people are getting to high mileage. Is there anything you've seen come on the market that has really been a difference like or a game changer in terms of parts or innovations that people could, could get for this? Uh, any companies that you're impressed with, Chris, that you recommend to people? Like I know there's a lot of talk as an example about true synthetic motor oil. I mean, I read a lot of articles and the idea is that the, the, the true ones, like liquid molly, there's people that just say there's nothing like it. Any comment about stuff that people could use that you've seen make a big difference in their, their longevity maintenance of their SOPs, Chris? Well, I mean, other than, you know, using a, a, a good synthetic oil, 
um, that's always that's always a plus. Um, other than that, I don't I can't really think of anything else at this time. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, David. You What's have any comment on that? Dave, please. Yeah. David Dickinson, you still there? Oh, yeah. Rocky Top Guru. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> this, this maintenance, um, I use like Royal Purple Synthetic for the manual transmissions. That seems to work. Okay, but say, say something about Royal Purple. They're interested in underwriting this show. I've had several meetings with them. Say something, because some people are fanatics about Royal Purple. Is If I was using Mobile One or I was using Castro, would I notice a difference? Or do you notice a difference in mileage and in performance and also being better for the turbo? Any comments about the Royal Purple brand? We don't, we're, they're, we're not working with them currently, but they're interested in working with us. I, I simply use it in the manual transmissions. And okay. It, after about a week of driving, a week, a week and a half yes. of driving, it just gets really smooth, um, you know, no gear clash, as long as there's no failure in the transmission. It doesn't fix the problem. Yes. But, uh, again, I don't have experience with their motor oils, but I do use their transmission oils. Ah, so, so and you recommend, do you recommend changing the fluid in the manual transmission to something like Royal Purple and noticing that you notice a difference? Uh, yeah, after, after a bit of driving, yeah. And, and okay. It's not necessary okay. to do the total flush. You know, when some okay. synthetic transmission fluid, they say, change the fluid, run it through the gears, change it again. Well, it's wasting yes. several quarts of fluid. Um, okay. But okay. I've had good luck with that. No. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. All right. Hey, Ron, um, I, make, I just want to make a quick SobNet announcement. Please, 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 right. please. Uh, yeah, many of you are SobNet users. There's just two things uh, I wanted to um, – I, I have announced them already, but I just want to make sure you knew about them. The uh, the first thing is um, now on the bulletin boards, if you go to the bulletin boards uh, near the top of the page under the title of the page, like general bulletin board or, or 900 bulletin board, there's a link now where you can enter your email address and each day it will send you a summary of what, had been po what has been posted with links, you know, the, the subject of the, of the posting and the link to that posting uh, in a, like a, a kind of daily digest email. So that's something that's available for you to sign up. Uh, and then the other thing I'll just mention is uh, the Saab Buddy uh, registry is um, at buddy.saabnet.com. And it, you might take a look at it. It's very interesting. It's a bunch of Saabers uh, who have signed up. Um, it, it was kind of a, a movement that started on the bulletin board. Uh, a, couple, uh, a bunch of users thought it would be nice if, uh, if uh, local Saabers were available to help uh, other Saabers who are traveling through the area. If they have a problem, a breakdown or something, they they could come to the this uh, one point on the uh, one page on the bulletin board and see who was nearby, and uh, that's I, I've uh, coded that all up into a database. Um, and so, not only is it to help uh, people who are traveling by, but it's also for um, local solvers to look at at uh, local solvers for non-local solvers who are interested in maybe purchasing them. You know, you can contact someone in the database and say, "Hey, I'm interested in this guy. I did this with a a, a Sobnet member. Uh, I bought a uh, an arrow out in Colorado, and, and I, uh, he he uh, he went out and looked at it for me and gave it the thumbs up, and and uh, mm -hmm. went out and bought and drove it home. Also, there are a bunch of uh, solvers who own their own tech twos, and uh, they're listed in there if they're you know willing to share their tech two or help people with their with their tech two. And you can certainly add yourself if you're available to that uh, registry. And they get, again, the the um, the web address is buddy.sobnet.com. Or you can just go to this main homepage and and you can you can uh, find it uh, navigate to it from the homepage. But buddy.sobnet.com. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, and I want to thank all the people through the years. Uh, and Dave Connor, I think, is retired, but Dave Connor had people come, and it was like a like a sob church there. People would come from many many states, and was just incredibly helpful. That's the one thing I, I think I loved early on about the sob community. It was just a very uh, a real community of people who just totally, I don't know, just beyond the usual. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. All right. Question, any questions about performance, any or mystery concerns or, or something you just, you want, or something that you did to fix your car, your sob, that was a new solution. No one had, is any, I'll give you guys an example. When I first had my, Oh God, I think it was a 99.95. It went into limp mode. Now I brought it to several mechanics, including, um, Kind of a renowned one. This is actually, this is going back probably 17 years. This is before I actually met Chris. 
So Chris, it was before I met Chris Ron, my, my master Saab mechanic in uh, Dorset, Vermont, Riz on Saab. And I finally, everyone told me that was insolvable, the, uh, the limp mode. There was varying op- opinions. And I had one guy fix it. I want to say it's, I think it, I think it's a Swedish deal. Scott, maybe help me on this. He's in Socrates, New York. He might, he might still be there. And he fixed it, and I, 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 he called me, and he said it was totally fine. So I, I got it out of a limp mode. I, knew, I guess limp mode is either straightforward or very confusing. Well, let's actually, let Chris comment on that. What's your take on the limp mode dilemma that some people have, that some people say is really hard to fix? What's your, what's your experience with limp mode in 9.5s, Chris? 9.5s? I mean, it's usually a problem in the throttle body. It's pretty much a pattern failure with the sensors in there. Um, yeah, it's pretty common. Um, you can tell, usually you can tell if it's in limp mode is when you turn the key on, you'll hear a click, 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 click. And that's the uh, limp mode, uh, relay, uh, that's being activated because the car is in limp mode. Um, and then if it's, it'll be, uh, you'll have a uh, idle will be really low. Uh, it'll want to stall when it's cold. It won't have full power. Um, and you can reset it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes that's all you need, but usually it'll come back after a while, and uh, usually have to end up either getting the uh, throttle body uh, repaired or uh, replaced. I want to say that uh, Josh at Goldwing has used throttle bodies. Yep. <laughs> so, um, Dave, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, Dave, uh, Rocky Top Guru. Well, generally, that's it. You know, on the nine fives, it's all pretty much unitized into the throttle body. You know, the nightmare okay. cars are the nine thousands, which you know, uh, is, and, um, or the nine threes. Of course, now you have a pedal potentiometer to deal with. Um, but the nine fives are pretty much the throttle bodies. It. You know. Are there any? I'd be curious, Chris and Dick. Um, any favorite, because people are looking, what I've heard, and I, we discussed this in the last show, that the value is going up. There's more people who have become aware that Saab is a, is a remarkable car, and that value-wise is an amazing investment. I always recommend going to Saab Net, because the people that are on there, they've owned their cars many years, and I usually have brought their cars to Saab Mechanics, which is great. Uh, just curious, Chris, are there any years of 9.5s? I'm going go to go to, we'll go to Rocky Top Guru and uh, ask Dick as well. Are there any years that you have found that to be to be better that you found like they worked out some of the kinks in the nine five series that you say to people like like the nine I don't know the nine the two oh five or the two oh uh, two thousand and six any recommendations uh, in terms of nine fives? Well, I mean a lot of it depends on condition, uh, but one thing that uh, the early cars uh, from like ninety well ninety nine to uh, two thousand and three. A lot of them uh, had sludging problems if, uh, the, you know, you didn't use the right oil and stuff. Uh, and after 2004, they changed the uh, crankcase breather, and uh, you don't see the problems with the uh, engine sludging as much. So that would be the, you know, the one advantage of getting something 2004 and up. Uh, but other than that, it really depends on the condition and, and how the car has been maintained. I agree with when you really not big problem. go ahead yeah you know, sludge is a big problem and you know oh five oh six and up i've had no issues um but early cars you could you could flush the sludge out every oil change you know yeah. are we ready to eat? What, about, what about if you apply that <laughs> i early on in my 2003 i was worried about sludge and and there was a retrofit ECV number six, I think, is the one that I had put in, you know, early on. And I'm assuming when I dropped the pan at 150 and the pickup was clean. Mm. I've never seen the, the, the uh, breather update do any good. Um, I remember way back when I was at the dealership, they had a bolt and come out. Okay, start updating all the cars. And then they found the system was freezing up. So they said, oh, stop now. Don't do any more. They never <laughs> well, <laughs> they go back and fix it. But. Um, yeah, it, I, I agree with, with Chris. It's more of a des- design of the uh, of the oil uh, separator box than anything else. Hey, uh, Chris, just for pe- you know, the, uh, this uh, the chat is recorded, and eventually, you know, I, I uh, in a few days I'll get it posted online for other people who couldn't make it here to uh, have a listen. 
But, um, you know, we, we talk about the, the infamous sludge problem. Can you just explain why that happens? I, you know, I, I, as I understand it, the catalytic converters under there heating things up. Is, is that part of it? Mm -hmm. And can you just go through and tell me, to explain why that, that sludge ha occurs? Chris, they, the question is, the whole sludging problem, what causes it? Uh, what's the cause of it? What is it? Right. I heard the same thing that, that Scott just said, Chris. You hear my voice okay, Chris? That yeah, yeah, it was really, just, it was it was the, it was a catalytic converter, baking basically heating the oil up terribly. And what, what, what's your take on the, the what's your well, big message today I mean, for that, people who have I mean, that didn't the catalytic converter didn't help matters. But my understanding was that they what they did were and a lot of manufacturers, not just Saab. Um, there was a lot of other manufacturers that were having the same type of problems. Uh, they went to these uh, low tension rings to get better gas mileage the piston mm -hmm. rings yeah. as a result they would get a lot more blow by going into the crankcase um and also to say you know to get better mileage they made the um the oil pump uh so that it, you know it didn't have any extra capacity so in order to protect the oil pump they put a very fine screen on the pickup and that's uh with the extra blow by and stuff and the fact that at first they didn't recommend even using uh, uh synthetic oil um huh. just a synthetic blend yeah that's all they were recommending when their cars were new yeah. so as a result depending on you know if you um didn't change oil uh often enough or you did a lot of stop and go um apparently that moisture got down to the crankcase uh mixed with the regular uh conventional uh synthetic blend oil and that caused the sludge. Um, that's the way I understand it. Uh, so uh, the crankcase ventilation kit was meant to, you know, hopefully get rid of some of that, um, um, the vapor, you know, getting into the oil, um, you know, to, to prevent, and then switching to uh, synthetic oil and then actually doing the oil changes more often. Um, and that uh, seems to uh, help with the problem. And then my this other the question then, the follow-up question I have about, about that. I'm sorry to interrupt, David. Um, That's okay. How often? Yeah. So this happens, but so in these cars where this happens, how often do you see it happening in those particular models? Chris or David? Go ahead, Chris. Chris or Dave? <laughs> I, I can't. I'm tell, I can't hear um, what what. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll, I'll, okay. So the question, yeah, the question that Scott just asked, is in those models, is it a frequent concern? Does it happen regularly? Like, I bought a 2002. I bought a beautiful. The, the condition it was a 95 2000. I got it in Connecticut. It was gorgeous. I brought it. I said to the. This is before I met Chris. This is going back about 15 years. Chris Rizan Rizan Saab. He's our master Saab tech co-host. I'm Glenn Brooks with the Saab and Travel Show. I get this car and I'm so excited. It's in Vermont three months, and I say do everything so it's in mint condition. The only thing he says to me. This is the first time I became aware of the sludge condition. Before I leave the shop, he says, "Oh, I saw some sludge." I had no idea. I, he said it to me, but it was like, okay. I didn't realize he could clean it out. So I guess as we're talking about sludge, Chris, when a person is going to purchase one of these years on Sobnet and they know the car has been well taken care of, how relevant is it to drop the pan like the other gentleman uh, said he did? What's the relevance of buying a 99, uh, 2003 9.5 of dropping the pan so you don't have to have to be a concern. So what are, what are your thoughts about preventative and also how common is it and what could be done? Can the, the treatment be done to clean the sludge? And then as an example, go to, a, a, let's say, a full synthetic oil. Share a little bit more because I really, some people have these cars and maybe they don't know what to do because they may, have, they may or may not have sludge and could we do something about it? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's probably not a bad idea if you're buying one of these cars to, um, to drop the pan and just check to make sure. Um, I mean, it's, uh, I replaced a lot of engines on those cars, uh, years ago. Um, uh, but I don't see that problem as much anymore with, with my customers. And I think a lot of that is the fact that they, um, they do use a good oil and they do get the oil changes done. Uh, so it's, I don't see it as much, but it's not only the nine fives, the nine threes, um, had the same problem, um, okay. up until 2002 uh, uh, or three, if it's a convertible. Um, 
And yeah, the, uh, the sledging was a big problem. And, and a lot of times, if somebody buys a car like that, I'll recommend, you know, just, just to be on the safe side, pull the pan, clean it out. Uh, sometimes I take them apart and they're fine. But other times, they're, you know, it's it's a good thing we did it. All right, I have two I have two pending questions. Uh, the first one is from Paul K. Paul, are you there? Yep, I'm out here. Uh, welcome, Paul. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, welcome. I have an 0793 Arrow with a B284 engine, six-speed manual, and I was just curious what the uh, limits are to tuning with that transmission. How much torque can I throw at it? For anybody who's go, with go it, ahead, Chris. Sorry, Chris, I'm, did you get I'm, I'm having trouble here. And it's oh, okay, I guess, uh, uh, repeat that. Speak up a little louder. Let me see. I want to make sure that Chris gets. So go ahead. One more time, Paul. Please ask to speak up a little bit. Let's see yeah. if, if Chris could hear it. Thank you. 0793 Arrow, six-speed manual. Wondering what the limits are for that F40 transmission. How much torque can you throw at it? Thank you, Paul. Boy. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure to t tell you the truth. I mean, um, I've seen uh, like a stage one that seems to be okay, but uh, after that, I'm not really sure how much you can put into that. Uh, okay. Since the clutch is a weak um, link, you know, slipping before the tranny will give you trouble. Uh, my grandson just had his V tune, and. Uh, had to put the reinforcement on the shift coupler so you didn't pop them off if you're shifting too hard or fast. But trannies stand up is just the, as long as you're not doing stupid things and dropping the clutch and peeling out. Um, but the clutch is a weak link. They'll slip in third gear, heavy Excel. Thank yeah, you. Maybe something to consider. We've had, uh, last chat, we had a, a few tuning questions. So maybe, maybe we can find yeah. that. Someone, uh, I don't know if uh, people uh, remember Jack Stoll, who was uh, very active in the community a while back uh, and is a Saab tuner. I, I think maybe I'll give him a call and see if he can't join us for the next one. That'd be great. I have uh, Scott, the next question wonderful. from um, from Don Rector. Don, are you there? Hey, Don. I'm not sure if he's Don. Yeah, Don. Welcome, Don. So he's going to solve and travel show. Here, here I have a, I, he, he wrote it to me uh, online. Okay, I, cool. I Go serious, ahead, uh, I have a, ser a serious rear camber problem. I don't see any adjustments on a 2005 93 Arc convertible. Do you need more detail Chris? than that? <laughs> you, yeah, you literally carry the question, Chris? No, I can't. I can't. I no, can't okay. Hear. Go repeat. Repeat it again, Scott, and I'll I'll convey okay. it to to Chris. Okay, yeah. thank so you. So I have a I have a uh, Chris. Can you hear me? Not very well. All right, re then uh, maybe you can repeat this for me. I have a serious rear camber problem. I don't see any adjustments uh, on a 2005 9.3 Arc convertible. It's so funny. I I'm having trouble. Okay, so it's a. It, and what year is what year is the car, Scott? Uh, it's a, a 2005 9.3 Arc convertible. It's a 2009 9.3 Arc, uh, Chris. 2009 9.3 Arc. Go, go ahead, uh, Scott. Rear, uh, rear camber problem. Rear camber problem. He doesn't see any adjustments. Doesn't see any adjustments. Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah. There is camber bolts on the back, right? Yes. Yep. They're usually seized, but there are camber bolts, both camber and toe, cam bolts. That's the voice of Dave from Rocky Top Google in Montague, Massachusetts, not far from where I'm doing this broadcast. By the way, you guys, I have a national show that airs. I have several hundred thousand people listening. It's the Vibrant Living Network. And uh, you guys are probably would enjoy that if you're sobbers. I get into all the all stuff you didn't learn in school. Yeah, how to cultivate the unconventional lifestyle and drive a sob and be more innovative. So that's uh, all right. So it, what, Scott? So it has bolts. It has bolts. What's what's the problem? The, the problem is not able to deal. Like, what do you feel in that question? What is the part of the question that we could help him with? You think? Yeah, I wish uh, he's he's there. It looks like like he's there online. Uh, Don, are you there? Can uh, you hear me? Yeah, I don't know. So I, that's as much oh, okay. information as I can get. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. So, it sounds like it wasn't. Please make them 
precise. I know it's hard, but yeah. if you make it precise, this way we got our master techs on board for you on the Saab and Travel Show. I'm Glenn Brooks. We got any more questions today, and we're going to give out the contact for Goldwing. We got Josh, who's got over 9,000 parts. Integrity there is always great. I I endorse and recommend Goldwing. They're fabulous over there. You won't have to be concerned. I'll get there, and I'll back it. This is Dick out in uh, Virginia. Hi, Dick. Uh, Welcome. This is Dick in Virginia. Welcome. Welcome, Dick. Yeah. And uh, so just a shout out to Josh uh, at Goldwing. <laughs> I've been bugging him about, uh, I had an 86, 900 uh, SPG, if it matters, but I'm after the wheel well, uh, the wheel flares. And I call him about once a month and bugging, but he's been good to me. He's uh, a good guy. Yeah, I got a problem. How much, how many hours of labor can I expect for somebody putting in a main wire harness in an 86, 900? You hear that, Chris? Whoa. Uh, so the main, the main one, uh, not the engine one, like the one that goes from the dash to the to the tail lights. I don't want to go to the tail lights. I've got a tech that's been getting me a lot of problems. Uh, the fellow before me uh, tried to put, he called it the main wire harness in. Uh, it, you know, the instrument cluster and the whole dash. Oh, okay. But it's coming off the distributor and the light, headlights and all that stuff. Okay. I know that, yeah, I know, I, I know that the Saab had a problem in 85 because they went right, to, yeah. to get their wire yeah. harness. And yeah, the installation. And and I'm and I think one of them got in my car. So. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that like I do the oil. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's a couple of harnesses there. There's the engine harness. There's a there's a there's like a front harness. Uh, Which one would and go? And then you got the. Then you got the harness that goes, in, you know, into, into the dash, and then I think there's one that actually goes all the way back to the tail lights. What uh, is the one that goes into the dash? Maybe he's, maybe it's not the main wire harness. Yeah, well, there's there's one that hooks up, it, it hooks up at the fuse box. Yeah. And then that goes into the dash. I mean, basically, you pretty much have to tear the dash out uh, to replace that. Well, I've been in there three. Times uh, I've I know that uh, I'm getting the right signal off the distributor for the tachometer. The tack is good, uh, everything is good. It's the it, it's the wires in between, and I'm not sure what the hell to do with that. Uh, yeah. But I don't want to go replacing a, a wire harness because I know that is uh, time excessive. But uh, the used to always be the 29 pin connectors. You know the red, white, and black connectors above the hood release cable uh, being a big issue. Well, I've, uh, I've got some people that know Saab here in the Falls Church. Uh, we've got the old Saab uh, distributor, uh, dealer, and mm -hmm. a lot of his people are still there. So I'm not just going to a gas station. And they, they uh, tell me that, uh, you know, they've, they've ch they put all their meters on it. I've had the cluster out twice i put in just the module just the the tack and uh, of course the, i guess it's the clock that goes with it uh and my uh, my clock works so it's getting power at least to that particular component so so what's not working the tachometer the tack yeah and i'm not oh, gonna okay the market thing it looks like a motorcycle you know uh, <laughs> I need that. I want to, I want to, um, Chris, go ahead and give us your website. I want to, Chris by, is my co-host. He's amazing. He's endorsed at Vermont. He's accessible for many, many, many places. You can uh, give out your phone number and, and website, Chris. And then we'll also acknowledge uh, Dave Dickerson, who I, I meet his customers all the time, actually. So Dave, okay. uh, Chris, go ahead and give out your website and phone number, would you please? Okay. My website is uh, Rizon Saab Repair. Um, and our uh, phone number is uh, 802 three two five three eight two seven and it's a beautiful drive up there now dave at rocky top guru is also on sobnet yep. he's in the pioneer valley and uh you want to give out your your contact as well dave 
Sure. So in the five college area uh, around Amherst, uh, the best contact is my email, david at rockytopguru.com. One of these days, we'll talk about your years in India and how you became a guru. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> glad, glad to have you on the call today, Dave. Oh, it's a pleasure. pleasure. Welcome. And uh, one more time, uh, Josh, because you're a, you're a main player, delivering these parts in good integrity and standing behind them the way you do and really being impeccable. How do people reach you about their parts concerns? Because you've got 7,000 parts. You're wonderful to work with. How do people reach you, Josh, over at Goldwing? So uh, Josh just happened to, his line just dropped. Let me, uh, let me. Uh, okay. Bring up. So Thanks, uh, Goldwing Saab Parts, it's, it's just like that. Uh, GoldwingSaabParts.com. Okay. All right. All right. So, Scott, we have any more questions today? Everybody's going to take a, a, a CS today. Uh, Everybody's do we, taking do a Saturday. Have, do we have uh, any final, one last final question? Anybody? Or are we good? Or at least a humorous comment, something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Deeply appreciate you. Stay posted. We're going to do another show very soon. I'm going to be doing the breaks, and we'll continue with Scott Rizon. Certainly keep a, a, a welcome door, welcome mat for uh, – Rocky Top Guru Dave, we'll, we'll ask Dave about his year of becoming a guru and the wonderful stuff he does. I meet his people all the time. Good work, Dave. Okay, thank you. And so, thank you, Scott. Yeah, so people, well, go can, ahead. Uh, go ahead. people can watch the Saab Network uh, general bulletin board. That's where I'll uh, announce the next uh, uh, Saab Master Tech chat. Uh, and then also just come by the general bulletin board. There's a lot of really uh, fun people uh, discussing more than just Saabs. Uh, hanging out together. So check it out. Thanks. All right. I have, I have one last question. I want to open this to Chris and Dave. I, I'm itching to get a mint condition 9,000. And I, I, I guess, oh, Josh already left. What do you think, Chris? And I, I know I've run this by you before. What's your take on getting a, I, I saw one on Sobnet. I think it was a 93. The guy said it's in mint condition. It's impeccable. He's, you know, he's had a, he's, he's the original owner. It does have a lot of miles. It's got 200,000 miles, but he said it's impeccable. What do you think? Do you think I could keep that in good repair with parts, or would they be concerned about parts? What's, what's your overall take on a 93? Uh, it was right under the – it wasn't the arrow. It was the one right under the arrow. I forgot. This yeah. see something. This, yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, see, Crazy or good yeah. idea? Um, the only thing I don't like about that is the uh, – uh, well, is it a um, – well, it doesn't really matter. But they had that traction control with the electronic throttle. Uh, um that was that was a, a problem on those cars. Yeah. When did that stop? What year? Let's see. They put it in '93 and '94. They didn't have it at all. And then I think in '95 they had it on some of the cars. Okay. So you're safe after '96. Uh, you go to '96, you're okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just. Uh, okay. It's. I mean, you can. I guess you can convert them over to uh, to get rid of the electronic throttle. But that's. It just seemed to be a, a lot of okay. problems with those things. Yeah. Uh, because right. they had traction control. It had one, and it would never develop any boost after trying to convert it over to manual throttle. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh, oh. What's your take, Dave? Stay away from them, or they're yeah, worth it if they're in certain conditions? Uh, go by body condition, basically. But, you know, if you okay. can avoid electronic throttle, that's good. If you can avoid the automatic, okay. that's good. Uh, okay. The automatics are good, except for you have to replace the governor's seal sometimes. But uh, most okay. people don't for the stick shift. What's your favorite car, Dave? The Rocky Top Guru. What's your favorite Saab? You know, if you had to get three Saabs from Saab that day, what would you be purchasing? Okay. Well, I'd go back for a classic 900 turbo. Okay. High okay. High speed. Okay, classic. And what year would that be? Oh, probably nice to have airbags. So I'd say probably 92. Yeah. Okay, 92. I couldn't lose with that year. They're much simpler without the airbags and ABS, but it's nice to have some safety systems okay. in place. All right. All right. All right. What, what's your favorite in the nine nine five line? Anything in the nine five line is is it Rocky Top Guru favorite? Well, I, I had, just had an 06 wagon, aero wagon, mm -hmm. I drove it for two hundred thousand mm -hmm. miles, and it got totaled. That was my favorite, most recent favorite. Wow. Okay. All right. 
All right. Well, listen, everybody, appreciate you guys. You catch me, my, my national show, Vibrant Living Network, Vibrant Living Network. I'm doing a whole series on I Write Your First Book. We have an event coming up at Carnegie Hall called The Road to Carnegie Hall. Scott, thanks a lot. I just, first of all, love the community. Love what, what, you, what you've been doing, Scott, has been major for the Saab community on so many levels. Thank you deeply. I love co-hosting with you, and I'm inspired by our next program. Thank you, Dave. Rocky Top Crew, Chris. I'll see you up there in northern, at Dorset, Vermont, for my next visit soon. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, big thank you to the full site members uh, on sobnet.com. They make the site uh, possible along with the sponsors. Thanks, everybody.